fucking fuck. Fuck that fucking kid. This is what I heard as Jason kicked open the door to the green room, raced past me in a fury, and threw his sailor hat into his locker before kicking the locker door shut. Bad show, I asked. Fuck you, Jason replied, kicking the locker again, and this time putting a dent in it. He then hastily fixed a smudge of makeup on his face, grabbed his sailor hat out of his broken locker, and headed backstage for his next cue. Jason and I were both mimes. <laughs> mimes at SeaWorld Sea Lion and Otter Show. <laughs> Jason had only been there at the show for about a month and had finally had one too many run-ins with shitty kids. And unfortunately, kids were pretty much the worst part of the job. If you've ever been to SeaWorld and seen the Sea Lion and Otter Show, then you've probably seen the guy who comes out into the crowd before the show starts and messes with everybody. Most people know them as Biffs. And for most people, it's their favorite part of the show. I was a Biff. I was your favorite part of the show. I started in 1999, and back then the show had an island theme, and the pre-show performer wasn't a mime or a Biff. We were called Juan Ho. I was hired after my audition where I did an impression of a roly-poly bug doing an impression of Shamu. I was 19, I came up with the idea in the parking lot before the audition, and it killed. The guy who trained me was one of the best pre-show performers there ever was. He was quick and wacky and agile, and he picked up immediately that I was none of those things. I was Buster Keaton to his Charlie Chaplin, the deadpan goof who could take a fall that looked so real it probably was. He once told me in rehearsal, you have an incredible gift that I don't have. You can make 2,500 people laugh just by raising your eyebrows. He was right. Summers at Sea Lion and Otter were the best back in those days. We would do six shows a day and everyone would be filled to capacity. In a day, we'd perform for about 12,000 people. We had an incredible stable of bits already put together through the years, like the one, two, three. Sounds just like the crowd. <laughs> we do kid in the moat. That's where you desperately tried to convince a little kid to jump into the moat. Build a family where you would grab someone's camera from the crowd, bring them up and start grabbing random people from all over the stadium to be in their family photo. If you set up a white couple with a black kid, it always got a good laugh. If you put a black and a white parent with an Asian kid, utter pandemonium. <laughs> My favorite thing was always the blindfold. This is where you pick a guy from the audience, you have him stand in the middle of the walkway against the glass, you tie a bandana around his eyes like a blindfold, raise his arms in the air, and then you slowly walk away. <laughs> then you lean against the wall and do nothing. Then you leave the stadium. <laughs> the guy just stands there like an idiot, it's great. For years, we had the freedom to try new things, improvise, develop new bits, and it was probably the most fun I'd ever had on stage. But now, a decade later, my legendary eyebrows were covered in white, and I squinted through show after show, replying my makeup every hour. The show switched themes to a submarine, and we weren't Biffs, we weren't Juan Hoes, we were mimes, and it sucked. Like, really sucked. None of us were trained mimes. We didn't know how to mime, and none of the jokes or bits we did were mime-esque. We never pulled on a fake rope or got trapped in a fucking box or whatever it is mimes do, I don't know because I never was one. I was just a chubby comedian who could take a fall and now all of a sudden someone said, put white on your face. Literally for this mime year, nothing changed in the pre-show except now we had white face on. They were fine if we talked, it made no sense. <laughs> but it did piss off kids. Holy shit, do kids hate mimes. <laughs> and let's be fair, everyone hates mimes. You've never walked into a room and seen a mime and were like, hell yeah. Your first reaction was to hurt the mime. And the kids did. They would punch us, kick us, pour water on us, throw food at us. The first few times a kid kicks you in the knee, you just try to play it off and ignore it because what a little shit, right? Their parents never cared and most of the time they just laughed harder at that than anything else. 
The fifth time you get kicked, you learn to fight back. <laughs> like I would take off my hat. I'd dip it in the moat, fill it with water, and then dump it on a child's head. We'd dump out the kid's popcorn, or we'd lock them outside of the stadium. The back and the forth was a staple of the show, but you had to really hate the kids to sell it. We became mimes because we had a new head of entertainment. He was an idiot. His only experience in entertainment was that he played trumpet. <laughs> he had worked his way up through the ranks at SeaWorld San Antonio, and they thought that maybe, just maybe, he could come in and give some of the shows a jolt. Spoiler alert, he did the opposite. He was a short man who demanded that his word was final and cared very little for what anyone else thought. You know, the best temperament for creative group endeavors. His terrible leadership was one thing, but his ideas were bad. I mean, hell, we were mimes all of a sudden. And after a few months of being mimes, lockers being dented, kids beating us while parents laughed, we decided it was time to revolt. Quietly, of course. One person. It began simply enough. We tried to do actual mime routines, pulling the rope, the box, whatever. It didn't matter because we were bad at them and actual mime bits aren't funny. We started to get written up by our bosses. So it was decided that a member of leadership would be out there to watch every show. Naturally, we took it further. Some of the mimes would put white circles around their noses instead of all white face or their mouths. One mime just did white makeup on his neck. I started to add facial hair to my makeup. More write-ups and none of us cared, mainly because they couldn't fire all of us, but they did fire Jason because he kicked a kid. <laughs> we pressed on and we began the greatest stretch of shows that were ever done in the history of Sea Lion. We called them the Dare Shows. In our dressing room, there was a whiteboard, and on it, it was your job to write out a dare for the mime in the next show. Whatever that dare was, you had to do it, because we would stay after our shifts to watch and make sure. For example, for the entire show, you have to keep fake crying. For the entire show, you have to act like you're having light stomach pain. For the entire show, you have to wear a woman's bikini top and never make reference to it. Mouth curse words when asking the audience to applaud volunteers. My two favorite dares came near the end. I dared one of the mimes that for the entire show, they had to start a bit and then halfway through, give up on it. No payoff, no reference, just give up and move on. It was perhaps the hardest I and the sound man have ever laughed. The other was when I was dared during a completely packed house to walk to the very top of the stadium and walk down to the bottom by going through each and every row, acting like I was looking for a seat. By the time I got to the bottom, the show had started. By the time I got to the office, I was told to go see our new head of entertainment. I walked into his office and he informed me that we would, he would be imposing a new rule at Sea Lion. We would all have to do the same exact pre-show. No changes, no improv, no going with the flow. From start to finish, there would be a set script and we'd all have to follow it or we'd be asked to leave the company. He'd seen the dare board and he wasn't having it. Two days later, I saw his script. What he didn't understand was that I, as you can tell, am long-winded. I also don't appreciate people who don't know how to do what I do telling me how to do it. So I sat down and wrote a three-page email to every person in leadership in my department and in the animal training department as well, explaining why this idea of making us all doing the same pre-show wasn't only a bad idea, but it was impossible. You don't have the same crowd 15 minutes before a show on a Tuesday in February as you might on July 3rd. If there was no one in the crowd, you couldn't do build a family unless you were trying to build my family, which was just me and my mom. And no one would laugh at that except for my dad. I had several examples, well thought out points in a history only a decade of doing the show could bring. The next afternoon, I was told the head of entertainment wanted to see me in his office before the nighttime sea lion show. I walked into his office and sitting across from his desk were the other three bosses of entertainment, all under him of course, but any one of these four could have fired me immediately. They didn't, they sat, I sat. And that's when the head of our department cursed me out for the next 25 minutes. After the first profanity lay sentence, I looked back at the other three bosses who all looked like they'd seen a ghost. They clearly weren't expecting this and did not look like they were enjoying it either. I had a notepad to take notes, but all I wrote was dick. 
He continued to berate me in my simple opinions. He told me I wasn't half as good as I thought I was. He called me an asshole several times, even going so far as to say that I had fucked up his vision for the show just by being there. He ended by telling me that if I wanted to give him my opinion on his shows again, I could come to his office, close the door, and say it to his face, because then we'd see what would happen. No one moved. No one said a word. Then he asked if I had any questions. I said, no, I have to go do a show now. I then stood up and pulled an imaginary rope to get out of the room. (laughs) I heard a giggle from one of the bosses. (laughs) I then went down to my cubicle and wrote an email to the head of HR about what had just happened. I CC'd everyone in the room on it except for the dick himself and pushed send. A couple weeks passed and I received a call from the head of HR. He wanted to ask me more about my email and have me come in to give an official statement. I was then called by the other three bosses who were in that room and they told me they had also just given a statement defending me. Apparently the dick had also written an email to HR claiming that I was the one who called him names and that I challenged him to a fight. He also assumed his underlings would have his back, but what he failed to understand was that he was a dick. He made every show worse and everyone hated him. After a few days, the punishments were handed down. I was suspended without pay for a week due to emailing all the people I did, and my work email access was revoked until further notice. The dick, on the other hand, got to keep his email access. However, he was never allowed to be alone in a meeting ever again. And if he was, the door to his office had to remain completely open. He was restricted from contacting me without approval from my immediate supervisor, and he was never allowed to receive a promotion within the company ever again. The other three bosses got me a thank you card and had everyone sign it. A few months later, the dick went back to San Antonio and we had a new head of entertainment who announced that at the end of the year, we'd be changing the Sea Lion show entirely. It would no longer be mimes. It was a small victory, but at this point, I was done. I quietly bowed out after 11 years on the stage and with white makeup dripping off my sweaty face. That is until 2012, when they asked me to fill in for a couple of weeks after they had to fire a Biff for something. When the time came to hire a new Biff, they just asked me to stay on. I just got married and we could definitely use the extra cash, so I said yes. The show did stay a bit more structured than in my original run, but overall it was just like being 19 again, except now I was in my 30s. I was pretty old for a Biff, a physically demanding job that always required jumping and dancing on a concrete stage while being completely soaked almost the entire time. You ran up and down the stairs for most of the pre-show, and now you didn't stop moving for about 40 minutes, as Biff's had a very prominent role in the actual show as well. After a few years and many nights of me coming home in tears because of back pain, knee pain, or just general soreness, I finally had to call it quits. After 14 years, I had done the job longer than anyone ever had. I had done more pre-shows than anyone in history, almost 9,000. I was tired. I was too old. But instead of accepting my resignation, they asked me to become the boss of the Biffs, to teach and train the newbies. So I did. Not before one last show. My goodbye show. In 2016, I walked from the top of the stadium to the bottom of the stadium, going row by row, (laughs) tripping over people, spilling drinks and popcorn, never saying a word, until I got to the top of the stage and for one last time said, 